you. So welcome, Hernan. Hey, Pablo. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here with all of you. Perfect. So let's start a little bit, Hernan. Uh, a lot of people have seen Latin America as the small brother, which is evolving and it's growing. But I would like to put some context. You co-founded Mercado Libre in 1999, which is almost uh, a couple of months, if not a year before the dot com. And I would love to hear a little bit about how it started all in Argentina. Yeah, sure. So uh, I think we are still the little brother, but, but growing strongly. <laughs> Uh, those early days, we started Mercado Libre, as you said, in 1999. Uh, Marcos Galperin, who, who was the, still the CEO of the company, and I studied at Stanford. That's where I met uh, him and, and, and I joined uh, Mercado Libre. We went back to Latin America when we graduated in 1999 and started Mercado Libre. We had the privilege of being in the Silicon Valley because we were at Stanford during those incredible years. If you think of the internet, as we think about it now, probably it got started in 96, 97. And that was when we landed in Palo Alto. So we had a terrific firsthand experience with everything that was going on there. And obviously at the time, there weren't many things happening in Latin America, but we thought that the kind of revolution that we were witnessing there was going to happen everywhere and decided to go back to, to Latin America and get started with uh, Mercado Libre. Initially with the idea of maybe replicating the eBay model, then it became more of, of the Amazon model and today it's a model of its own. But yeah, those early days uh, we were looking for, for internet users because there were very few and all of those were dial-up connected uh, and e-commerce penetration was close to zero we started the e-commerce e penetration in the region uh, and fast forward a couple of decades and today we have a fully developed uh, tech uh, ecosystem with players in all the stages in all the industries in, in all the the different kind of layers that you can think of uh, and the progress has been incredible. And I think that the key, key inflection point was mobile internet that basically expanded uh, the reach of the internet to almost everyone in, in the region. Before that, obviously, it first was penetration of internet, then it was penetration of broadband. But I think it wasn't until mobile internet that we saw an incredible takeoff in Latin America. There are two moments, I think, in Mercado Libre that will give uh, our audience a very good understanding of the company. As you said before, the company was aiming to replicate like an eBay model as an idea in Latin America, in many countries, in many different cities. But then in 2001, you got in contact with eBay as a more formal relationship and they uh, participate in the company as, as an investor. So uh, how this moment uh, started in terms of how eBay knew about you guys or how did you start talking with eBay about, hey, we are the same you are, but for Latin America, how that conversation started? Yeah, so at the time, eBay was by far the most successful tech company in the world. It was kind of what you may think of Google plus Facebook combined today or an Amazon. Uh, they were larger than, than Amazon, than Yahoo, that was at the time, the, the Google, uh, etc. So it was really uh, an incredible company. And they were thinking about expanding globally. Uh, and they were doing some kind of analysis in Latin America. They met us, they met some of the other players that were around at the time, ended up deciding that Merco Libre was the best team to partner with probably because of our long-term vision uh, and with that yeah, we, we got together they contributed an asset that they had acquired indirectly in in brazil so so they had a company in europe that they wanted to take over and uh, they took over that operation that operation ended up having a subsidiary in brazil they wanted to contribute that operation to one of the players in latin america in an exchange 
for on the one hand uh, shares of, of that player and on the other hand uh, that came also with an operational best practice sharing agreement we we did the deal because of the former but the latter ended up being really really beneficial for us because again at the time ebay was a, a great uh, tech company whatever we we're planning to do they had already done it or had already explored it so we could really get into the company and see the results of all the tests and, and all the exploration they've done and only pick what we thought uh, was uh, good for for us and also at the time again we started the company at the boom of the internet and then soon after uh, the bust came in and, and, and everyone thought that the internet was going to be dead and the fact that ebay that was still in those days a, a great company was backing us was somehow partnering with us was a, a great 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 kind of support for for the team was a uh, an influx of, of uh, kind of energy into the company and then the, the story obviously deviated at the beginning we were learning a lot of things from them then probably we were learning also many things from us <laughs> Uh, and eventually, we ended up selling uh, their shares of Mercado Libre at a great profit, but they could have made even more money if they would have stayed longer. But I think what was a great thing for Mercado Libre ended up being a fantastic financial um, kind of move for eBay because they made lots of money out of that. But, but yeah, that, that's kind of the, the story. And uh, yeah, it was one of those inflection points. It's hard to try to think what would have happened hadn't we done that deal but yeah, that deal at that time uh, helped us big time because i think the other com component of, of interest for ebay which at that moment there were a lot of software startups and a lot of like startups running in the internet but i think mercado libre might be one of the most successful startups in terms of going rapidly to new countries right like at that moment you can think of microsoft or you can think of yahoo but they actually don't go and open a new market they just open a local office and then do some sales and but they're not like evangelizing the market and building a new like whole infrastructure and you expand pretty fast until the point you got to 2006 maybe 2007 that you decided to become a public company in nasdaq in the us which at that time for any other startup which were not based in the US was like really, really unthinkable, right? Yeah, so the expansion uh, happened very naturally. From day zero, we, we wanted to create a regional platform. Part of that was because, as I said, at the time, there weren't many uh, internet users in any country. So we had to go regional to believe that there was going to be enough critical mass. Also, given that we were starting in Argentina, Argentina was a small country. So also from day zero, we decided that we had to, to expand. So uh, that was part of the plan uh, from, from day one and, and we executed on it. So we started the company officially in August, 1999. And by November, December, we were present like in seven, eight countries or so really going uh, regional very rapidly then um, how we decided to to go public in, in the nasdaq uh, the assumption we had at the time of the deal with ebay was that eventually ebay was going to acquire mercado libre and there were many conversations with them in that regard and it was a dance that, that we could never really fully complete uh, when they would come and say hey you're worth 200 we said no we think we're worth 300 and then they would come back sometime later saying okay you're worth 300 and we would say no but now we're worth <laughs> 400 uh, and that dance kept on going for for some time then eventually uh, interestingly we we got uh, an agreement with them but then they they got kind of afraid of, of that agreement and and eBay at the time started to kind of go sideways after having had a terrific trajectory upwards. 
So so they got nervous and, and decided uh, not to basically close that deal that we had agreed on. And then we said, okay, if, if eBay we will not buy us and uh, they don't believe that we're worth this much, let's try and, and, and go public. And, and we would look at, at the Googles of, of the world and, and at the time we, we saw them as incredible and reachable companies. But at the same time, we, we looked at all publicly listed companies in the US and there were many that we thought that if those guys could do it, why, why <laughs> can't we? So, so we, we went forward and it was a process that, that probably took us a year to get ready, even though the company was a very well organized company, very disciplined company, but it took us a year to, to, to get ready. It's a complex process, right? Uh, regardless of yeah. the need of the company, it's a complex process. Yeah, you, you, you need to, to be able to produce uh, financial reports on, on a very timely manner with, with, with some kind of uh, requirements, etc. So, so we were almost there, but not fully there. So, so it took us some time to be totally comfortable that we could deliver on those deadlines. Uh, and then again, when we started talking about that publicly, people said that is crazy. Latin American companies do not IPO in the US, do not IPO the NASDAQ. Uh, and Crazy. why would it? Yeah. But I, lo, lo, to, today, companies short, yeah. can look at, today, companies can look uh, at what Marco Oliver did and, and try to replicate that or at least uh, work from that base. In our time, we, we had basically no analogy whatsoever. So <laughs> we had to basically do things as we thought should be done. And now you're a public company, Mercado Libre, listed in NASDAQ and around 90 billion with a B market cap. So congrats, Hernan. And after Mercado Libre, you decided to create or co-found CASEC, which to give a little intro, CASEC is one of the most active, but also one of the top tier funds in Latin America, investing, in, and correct me if I'm wrong, mainly in tech startups. And... Um, to, to name a uh, some startups to give people a little context, they invested in Confio, which is a lending platform in Mexico, super successful. Kabak, which just became the first unicorn in Mexico. Notco, which Bistone was talking a little bit about it yesterday, which is a food in industry company. And then I want to talk a little bit with you, uh, Hernan, about Nubank. Nubank, I think it was the first big, big startup in Brazil, getting money from Sequoia, from Founders Fund, but also with you guys uh, joining their investor portfolio very early, right? Yeah. So uh, what we, do you we, see we think Nubank? That, how did, did you find Nubank? Uh, well, we think that Nubank is the most incredible company that has emerged in Latin America in the last decade. Uh, and I think it, it, it will, will compete eventually with Mercado Libre as, as the top uh, Latin American company, because it's, it's incredible what they do, as much as what Mercado Libre does is really incredible. So uh, we're really proud of being part of the company. Uh, and and uh, how did we meet the company? It's an interesting story. Uh, as you, you, you can see that it's a small world, even though it looks very large. Uh, the founder, David Vélez, is, is someone that we had met previously because he was working at General Atlantic when General Atlantic did due diligence on Mercado Libre. So we met him then. Then also uh, David left GA and went to Stanford for his MBA. So, so we always have some kind of a connection with with Stanford because both Nicolas and I are uh, former Stanford MBAs. Uh, and then uh, David went to work for Sequoia. So that also answers part of, of your question. Uh, and we are close to, to Sequoia. We, we know Doug Leone and Michael Moritz. They are investors in our funds. We have a close relationship with them. Uh, and therefore we, we started working with David, looking into deals together. David representing Sequoia and, and, and Kasek on the other side. And then one day, uh, David called us and saying that he was leaving Sequoia to start a bank in Brazil. We thought he was totally crazy. <laughs> but at the same time, we, we realized that it was a gigantic 
opportunity and that if there was someone that eventually could have a chance of basically breaking into the oligopoly that, that large banks have in, in Brazil was him. So we, we placed a bet there together with Sequoia uh, and obviously ended up being a very successful bet. And we ended up investing in five rounds in, in Nubank. Uh, and again, we, we, the kind of company, the kind of culture, the, the kind of product that David and his team built is, is incredible. It's really a totally different level of sensitivity to customer needs and, and really trying to serve the clients at a level that they were not used to in the financial market in Latin America. There, there is this company which a lot of people might heard in TechCrunch or in any other like news startup world media in Latin America, which is Rappi, which became famous because they fundraised $1 billion, which was like crazy for any standard of the world, regardless from the Bay Area to China to any place you might think about. So Kasek being one of the first speakers of deals in the region, why is not invested in Rappi? Clearly a mistake. <laughs> Maybe we, we did not assess uh, that that uh, assessed that opportunity uh, the right way, but actually the, the kind of execution that Rappi has had in the region was incredible. There's one word that we always uh, look for in our startup. Maybe it's a combination of two words that is light speed, uh, and they had an incredible light speed. If you were asking about Mercolibre and how fast we expanded into many countries, uh, they did that even faster than we did it uh, and really with a level of depth that, that was incredible. Uh, and, and clearly now we, with the pandemic that accelerating all these trends, they have proven on the one hand that people want that service and on the other hand that they can scale and deliver when demand comes in strongly. So, so it's amazing what they've done. And it's unfortunate that we're not an <laughs> investor there. So um, just to give some context, in, in Latin America, you started Mercado Libre in 1999. In Argentina, Latin America is not a similar region as Europe. It's not very easy to move from country to country. Legislation is fairly different in every country. So if you people think like Europe, it's region, and Latin America, it's exactly the same thing. It's not. It's a very complex region. But uh, coming today, today, how do you how do you see, for instance, um, is there a regional market? Is there, is there many local markets? How would Kasek assess a company in those terms? Do you like to see companies that see all Latin America as a whole market or you prefer that they go to Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires as the strategic points? It, it is a great uh, question, Pablo, and I think it depends. Uh, we always highlight that when, when people talk about Latin America as one single country, it's like, no, it's a collection of many countries. In some things, those countries behave uh, very similarly. So you can see that the, the, the way you have to develop a product for a consumer in Brazil might be similar to the way you have to develop that same product to a consumer in Mexico or in Chile or in Argentina. But then regulation, customs, etc., cetera, are, are different. So for instance, for the financial uh, industry, the expansion is more challenging because they are, it's a, regulation is very relevant. And you need typically approvals from the central banks of each country. So it's not that easy to move from one to the next. If you're doing e-commerce, maybe in the middle, so maybe you, you might not be able to replicate your, uh, I don't know, suppliers uh, structure because those suppliers, if they are serving Brazil, will not immediately transfer to Mexico or to Uruguay. But, but probably the, 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 the consumer facing layer, your application, the kind of uh, technology that you have there is uh, applicable to all the countries. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a mix and 
what do we recommend uh, companies? It's case by case. Typically, we do like companies to go regional, but today, on the one hand, each individual country is much, much larger versus uh, what it was two decades ago when we started Mercado Libre. So uh, sometimes we tell them, you know, make sure that you prove your concept in one country, that you have that engine going somehow, and then expand from some kind of a strong position uh, and not uh, going too fast into the expansion because you think that uh, eventually being having a flag in each country will, will make a, a difference. So again, it's case by case, but, but your, your point is, is right on it. Uh, Latin America is a collection of countries. I think consumers in general behave somehow similarly, but regulation is, is quite different country by country. One of the things that we have seen in the startup right now, we are in more than 140 countries and a lot of them have like early stage ecosystems, mid stage and consolidated ecosystems in terms of entrepreneurship. And one of the things that, that we managed to observe is that we have like two, two categories in terms of how new startups are focusing on developing new businesses or new products. One I would say is efficiency and it's, it turns around doing things faster and a little bit better than existing players. So this is more obvious in fintech, in e-commerce, in logistics, and the other, and this usually comes at the early stage of the ecosystem and the later stage ecosystem have a more sophisticated uh, companies which focus much more on a very sophisticated product that regardless of, of them being the original idea creator, they do a very better version of the product of the service, which might be good enough to be in any country or any ecosystem in the world. So what are your thoughts in terms of Latin America of these two ideas? Yeah, obviously there's lots of literature about innovation and invention and sometimes they are combined sometimes they are not exactly the same what we've seen in latin america is that initially because the rest of the world was maybe more developed and local entrepreneurs could see what was going on in asia or in the us and then look at latin america and say hey this is an empty space here this is another empty space there so let's go and address those opportunities with those solutions that have been developed uh, in other regions. Most entrepreneurs, were, what they did was that, and, and that was the case of, of Mercado Libre and the case of, of many of the first generation of successful Latin American companies, Latin American startups. In our portfolio one, we have many of those, but that is the, the copycat of, of something else in, in the world. We have lots of respects for that strategy because one thing is to say, hey, I see this opportunity in, in Latin America. I saw how that opportunity was addressed in, in the US or in China, uh, and I'm going to bring that idea to Latin America. But from, from that very high <laughs> level kind of thinking all the way to executing and developing a successful company, there's, there are, I don't know, there's an entire ocean in the middle. Yeah. So, so it, it requires, and, and then when you, at a very high level, you say, okay, Marco Lira is the, eBay of Latin America. But when you go one level down, two levels down, you start realizing that for every single friction point, there's an, an innovative solution that is totally different to what others have done in other markets. So we have really high respects for entrepreneurs that can see that kind of opportunity because they looked at other markets and they looked at what hasn't been developed yet in, in the region, but then have the capacity to make that happen. But yeah, you're totally right. The first uh, wave of entrepreneurs was more related to that and then the second wave was, was much more looking at what kind of problems do i have here in latin america that we might solve with technology uh, and and then they started doing that because they saw that local problem maybe one day they woke up and realized that that same problem was was also relevant in europe or in asia or in the us and started expanding uh, globally and uh, and the case of a company like, like Nubank that you were mentioning is the largest digital bank in the world. And it's funny for us because today we see DEX 
of global entrepreneurs saying, hey, I want to build the new bank for Germany or I want to build <laughs> the new bank for the UK or uh, so really innovative companies or no, company like Quinto Andar it is a, initially was a marketplace for, for long-term rentals. Uh, we started to see also companies that, that then were launched in Europe or in Asia following that same model. But the guys from Quinto Andar thought from, from the ground up, not that they were inspired by another idea. They, they yeah, you are always like, inspired. Yeah, you, you always get inspiration from many, many things, right? At the same time, what, what I say always when, when I get this kind of question is, if you look at the most successful companies today in the world, like Apple or Facebook or Google, they were not the first ones in their Yeah, category. exactly. They, they were really the best ones. And, and, the, and on top of that, they put incredible innovation and terrific execution capabilities, etc., to build really incredible companies. But, but like Google was not the first search engine yeah. or, and, and, and or for, Facebook for me, was not the first social network. For me, one of the, the, the main key aspects of, of uh, an ecosystem that it's evolving to become mature is that we start to see companies doing that. It doesn't matter if they were the first mover or not, but they're starting to have products or services good enough that if you move okay. those services to China or the US okay. or Europe, people in Europe is gonna be like, okay, Nubank, it's amazing. And it's like, it's not like, oh, Nubank, oh, but because it, Latin America might be not as good as a service as, I don't know, any other Nubank. But I think that's a great, great point for us as, as a region, right? And to I that point, I would be, I, I have three more questions. The, the next one is, in the last maybe two years, maybe three, we have seen top tier uh, Bay Area funds coming into Latin America. We used to have many years ago, Latin America divided in Brazil and then the rest of Latin America, right? But then now the region is becoming more as, a, as the same region. And we've seen in recent Horowitz, Sequoia, Axel coming at the beginning a little bit shy with small investments, but they are getting more used to invest in the region. Um, so what, what do you think about those funds starting to be more proactive in the region? Is that bad for CASEC? Is that good for CASEC, for the ecosystem? I think it's certainly great for the ecosystem. The ecosystem, at the end of the day, needs to serve in the best possible way the entrepreneurs that are emerging in the region. And those entrepreneurs need advice, need capital. So. The more uh, people come here, the better for them. The more capital, uh, the better. So, so clearly, I think it's, it's it's a positive thing for us, for Kasek. I think it's very complementary. At the early stage level, I think the kind of work we can do is not something that someone can easily do by having an office in Palo Alto, Menlo Park, or, or New York, or Shanghai. So, so I think that we can really help in that heavy lifting that companies go through at the beginning and then we we love to partner with, with those kind of funds that can add another thing another layer of expertise another layer of, of uh, smart advice so so i think it's great for it and and you're totally right we've seen that evolution at the beginning there was no one in the region and in i always tell the same story but in our early days in marco libre our investors deck had a full section initially about Latin America and where it was and how big it, it was and what kind of people lived in the region, mm -hmm. etc. to try to make the point that there was an interesting region there. Uh, and today you can skip that section altogether because all global investors know about Latin America, all global investors know that very successful companies have been created like Mercado Libre, but then also Stone and Pax Seguro and XP and, and many others. And they, they've also seen what's happening in the uh, kind of private market, right? Uh, Mercado Libre went public in 2007. And that year we were the, the most valuable private company in the region. And we went public at a valuation of $800 million. <laughs> Today, you can count probably in Latin America 20 unicorns, and you can count, I think, like 100 companies that are worth uh, above $100 million. And you have Nubank that, that closed its last round at a valuation of $25 billion. So the ecosystem has changed significantly, significantly. 
Uh, and today, you don't have to prove that there's an opportunity in Latin America. Obviously, you have to prove that you can find the right opportunities <laughs> in Latin America and invest in them and, and help them grow, etc. But I think the case for the industry is as strong as it's ever been. So to that point, Hernan, we, we have seen maybe from 2018, more intensely 2019, a lot of activities from SoftBank in the region. And one of the things that I worried as a Latin American long-term ecosystem builder, it's that SoftBank came and, and do very high valuations because, and, and I can quote them here in which they say that they don't care a lot about valuations because if you became what they think you're going to become, it's irrelevant your valuation, but it is relevant when you impact the valuation in a current market. So what, do, what are your thoughts regarding valuations uh, and impact from SoftBank in terms of those valuations? Uh, I can speak more about uh, SoftBank in Latin America. Uh, there I, I have first-hand experience dealing with them, negotiating with them, partnering with them. I don't have total visibility at what uh, SoftBank has done globally. But, but what I can say is that they are first big, big believers in these amazing technology, secular trends that we're all experiencing. Uh, and that maybe they went a little bit overboard in some of those bets. Uh, and, and, and the press has really hammered them very, very nasty uh, uh, in, in, in those cases. But, but then I'm sure that their portfolio is doing really well because they, they have great companies. Again, I, I haven't seen their consolidated numbers. And, and you can talk about oh, we were, we were, we were. But I'm sure they, they have many other companies that yeah. have done really well, even Uber that at the point people were criticizing. And now it's, it's way, well into the money, in the money for them. <laughs> so. So again, I, 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 it's always easy to, if you, if you take our portfolio and pick on that one company that's not doing yeah. well, where you can say, hey, your performance is horrible. And if I show you consolidated numbers, we're probably one of the top uh, funds globally in terms of returns in dollars. So, so, so again, I, I just want to make sure that we try <laughs> to measure things objectively. And sometimes yeah. if you don't have the full picture, it's hard to do that because in this industry, at the end of the day, you depend, you depend on those breakout companies and whatever happens with the rest almost yeah. doesn't matter. But, but in Latin America, your question is, is a great one. And, and I, I, we got that a lot from our LPs. Uh, and they were basically asking, is there life after SoftBank? Uh, and we didn't know. We thought yes, but, but we didn't know. And now I can say with total confidence, yes, because we've seen that some of those companies that raised uh, capital from SoftBank Latin America and that at the time those valuations looked somehow high, uh, were totally validated by new investors that came later uh, and ended up investing at even higher valuations with companies that had a really nice trajectory. So, so we had like uh, Kavak that you mentioned in, in our portfolio, an incredible company, SoftBank led a, a round at a valuation of slightly over a billion dollars and, and the company, now it's closing around at a much higher valuation. Uh, and you have companies like Madeira, Madeira, or Logi, or, or, or in, in our portfolio that have gone through the same kind of story. The SoftBank came in, offered what at the time looked like an aggressive check, but then someone else came in later and offered a more aggressive check. And you mentioned Rappi earlier, and the same thing with, with Rappi. So, so again, I think that uh, SoftBank saw this opportunity in Latin America played a, a very aggressive bet with, with their fund. Uh, and I'm sure they're going to be very successful with that fund. And to wrap up our session, I think we have around five minutes left. I would like to hear your opinion about, there's a lot of companies, yeah, working in Latin America, but we're also starting to see a lot of companies wanting to move to Latin America. Like from big, big companies like Stripe, but also mid-sized companies like eToro and different like investing platforms. Like what, what do you think are the biggest challenges for those companies trying to attract or prospect the Latin American market? I think it's great that that is happening. Uh, and it's another layer 
into the development of the local ecosystem. And I think that's the beauty of, of Latin America, maybe compared to China. Like uh, in China, it's a much more regulated uh, market where the government basically decides wh what goes and what doesn't. And Latin America is quite open market, open economies, uh, where uh, you may you are going to have lots of successful local companies, and you're going to have lots of successful global companies. Uh, and then when a global company will will win versus a, a local company, it'll be case by case. But our take is that whenever there are local friction points, so things that are very specific to, to the region, the local entrepreneur will have an edge over the global player. And whenever global networks apply and there's an advantage uh, for, for being local, either because you access global capital markets or because you access global clients or those kind of things, maybe the global players will, will have an edge. So it is case by case, uh, and I'm sure that the end picture is going to be one where we'll have both some very successful global companies having great businesses in Latin America and some very successful local entrepreneurs having incredible companies in Latin America. One of our main uh, objectives in Startup Grind is to connect global ecosystems. Uh, I haven't asked you this before, but have, have you invested in companies from other areas or countries but they, that they want to move to start operating in Latin America? No, we, we haven't. Uh, a few times we've been offered that opportunity. Uh, so there's a company globally that wants to enter Latin America. So we were offered to invest in that company, uh, the mothership, right? And, and then yeah. help them get into Latin America. In some of those cases, it would have uh, been really successful financially, but that is not what we do. What we do is we try to partner with the best entrepreneurs and we want to have a, a direct connection with those entrepreneurs in oh. Latin America. I think we, we know that we, we, we somehow manage the Latin American ecosystem very well, but, but globally, maybe there are other funds that can do that better. So our sweet spot is uh, focus on Latin America with entrepreneurs that are developing market companies that initially are focused in the Latin American market. And to wrap up the session, Hernan, what are your predictions in terms of liquidity event for the region? I, local IPOs, more M&As, what do you think is going to happen maybe between this year and the next one? All, all, all that you mentioned and more. <laughs> I think, I, again, the, the world is experiencing an incredible global liquidity. Uh, and that will translate uh, also into more liquidity for Latin America. You you have a very active now public equity market in Brazil yeah. that is desperate for tech stories. So, so many uh, Brazilian companies, Brazilian tech companies are going public there because the, the market wants to have exposure to, to tech. Uh, you have many SPACs that are being created by local players that will go after local companies. There are also lots of global SPACs that are uh, looking into Latin American companies. And on top of all that, you, you have uh, global markets, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, etc., that today consider Latin America as a very attractive region. Uh, and there have been very successful cases with the IPOs of, again, Mercado Libre, Pax Seguro, Stone, uh, XP, etc. Uh, and, and you will have more companies like, like I think the, the, the new banks and the Madeira Madeiras and the Logis and, and the Jimpas and the Cavax will, will follow that path. So, so we will have a, a great, great cohort of amazing Latin American companies that are globally listed. Perfect, Hernan. Thank you very much. I also think it's amazing how through the pandemic, the deploy of capital, it's a little bit more difficult. So the valuations generally have increased. So let's hope that trend keeps going by, by their own means and the startups growth. So thank you, thank you very much for showing Latin America power to the world. I'm excited to see what's coming next. Oh, thank you everyone and thank you, Pablo, for your great questions. Perfect, take care.